Good evening, everyone. Someone in a yellow vest has just walked into the room. I hope that doesn't mean there's going to be a demonstration. But I think it's just bicycle safety. Oh, very good. Thank you. Um, uh, hello, everyone. I'm Matthew Taylor. I'm the RSO's chief executive. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here for this evening's special event. Um, can you make sure your phone is switched to silent? Uh, we're filming tonight's event and live streaming over the web, so welcome to everyone joining us online. The hashtag is RSA Blueprint if you'd like to get involved in the discussion on Twitter. Uh, we do hope you're gonna, you will get engaged in the debate and let us know your thoughts because tonight is about kick-starting um, a new and positive conversation. It's a conversation that's been had before, but I think uh, we want to try and make it in slightly different terms about what the public want and expect from the businesses that serve them, as well as how companies themselves can think harder about their role in and impact on the society in which they operate. We all know that fairness, or perhaps even more strongly unfairness, is something we feel instinctively on an individual human level. And we're aware that in recent years there's been a growing public dis-ease with business behaviour and a sense that too often companies are not playing fair, whether that's in relation to executive pay, tax, workers' rights and protections, or myriad of other issues. But is the pursuit of fairness really possible as a core business goals. Some people have argued eloquently that it should not be. Or is this the best we can hope for? Is the best we can hope for the avoidance of manifest unfairness? How ambitious should we be? So that's the essay question we've set for our expert panel tonight. Um, I'd like to start by thanking our friends and colleagues at A Blueprint for Better Business for helping us bring such a distinguished group together. With us this evening, we have Baroness Honora O'Neill, philosopher, crossbench peer, leading public thinker on issues of justice and ethics, accountability and trust, amongst other things. Justin King, one of the UK's most admired business figures, well known formerly as a boss of Sainsbury's for over a decade, now vice chairman of the private equity firm Terra Firma, a member of the board at MS. Jane Corbett is assistant mayor of Liverpool, who's spearheading the city's ambitious agenda on fairness. And from our event partners, Blueprint, it's a particular pleasure to be joined by their CEO, Charles Wookie. Now, Charles, you're going to open us up with a few provocative comments, then the panel are going to respond. I'm going to try to engineer a lively debate between them, and then we're going to bring you in for a conversation. And just to make sure you stay here right to the end, there's drinks at the end, so there's an extra, extra inducement. Uh, but I think it's going to be a really lively uh, conversation. So please, just to show a bit of kind of energy. Let's welcome Charles Wookie. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Matthew and the RSA team for collaborating with us on this event um, uh, and to, indeed to the panel. So um, <laughs> this is a very brief introduction. So who is us? Uh, a Blueprint for Better Business is a charity. We exist to help create a better society through better business. Uh, we believe that business can and should be driven by a purpose that benefit society and thereby delivers a fair return to investors. Um, along with many others, we believe that the world needs a system change. We need to move from a system which is optimized, an economic system optimized for growth and profit, to an economic system which is optimized for human well-being and a sustainable ecosystem. This is an enormously important, challenging 10 years ahead, and we believe that business has a very important role to play in that. And that crucial role that business needs to play in that system shift requires a change of thinking and action in business. And in particular, our view is that it needs to displace two dominant ideas which have helped shape the way in which businesses think and act over the last 40 years or so in the US and UK particularly. One is the idea that the purpose of business is to maximize profit, and the other is the idea that people are self-interested and motivated simply by money, status, and power. So we believe that if businesses think differently about both of these, adopt a more realistic view of people and act accordingly, they can have a huge agency to help create a better society. So we work mostly with the leaders of major companies who are personally committed to advancing this way of thinking in their organizations, and we want to help to create a new normal in which, which we believe is absolutely vital if this system shift, uh, on which we all depend actually, is to happen. So that's, that's our work and that's what uh, our, our point of view. So why are we here? Uh, why this audience? And what are the key points in the Fairness in Business paper, which uh, you, 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 I think everybody in the hall was sent, and I'm, some of you may even have avidly read. Um, so um, well, I think we should start with Marx. Not Karl, but Groucho. 
So Groucho said, the secret of business success is honesty and fair dealing. So if you can fake those, you've got it made. <laughs> but we're here because business fairness is one of the central issues at stake in business becoming enablers rather than blockers of this system change. And as Matthew was saying, accusations of unfairness of different kinds, essentially the misuse of the asymmetry of power and knowledge that business has, whether that's around customers, suppliers, externalizing environmental or social costs, lies at the heart of the disconnect between business and society. Okay, but fairness means lots and lots of different things, right? And in many ways, life is just unfair. Competitive markets create winners and losers. So is it actually helpful to challenge business on the theme of fairness, or is it just fire in the sky? Does it shed more heat than light? So these are questions of philosophy, of practical business, and of societal perspective. So it's really wonderful to have a panel this evening which represents those three constituencies, and indeed an audience where I know a lot of senior business people are here with RSA members who themselves are business leaders and, and from civil society as well. So I think we're in the right place with the right group of people to have the right conversation. So I'm just going to say for a few minutes now what our point of view is about fairness and how, what's the argument of this paper. So, and the first thing to say is, it's a series, if anybody's had a look at it, it's a series of provocations. This is not a thesis with the answer to the question of fairness, okay, just to manage everybody's expectations about the paper. But I hope it's designed to help people think about this. And essentially, the starting point is that the, the, the idea of fairness is something that's deeply ingrained in humanity. From the earliest moments of our lives, children have a deep sense of fairness, especially to themselves. And in practice, though, we're often conflicted about what we think fairness means in a particular situation. Now, for business, I think it helps to think about fairness, not in the abstract, but in the context of acting fairly. And then the second thing that's worth noting is that a business is, in fact, a social organization. It's first and foremost a series of human relationships with customers, suppliers, the communities a business depends on, investors, regulators, and so on. And once we think in this way about a business, the question of are we acting fairly in relation to each of our stakeholders is engaged. And we argue that in thinking about what it means to act fairly, three things matter. How a decision is made, in what frame of mind, and with what result. All three are important, but the most important, in our view, is the frame of mind, which of course goes back to purpose and what the organization sees itself as existing to do. Now, when difficult decisions are being made in competitive situations about the sharing of benefits or burdens, there are always trade-offs and opportunity costs. Being fairer to one means being less fair to another. And sometimes, of course, there are very difficult competing goods at stake. But we argue that even if it's not possible for a business to be as fair as it would like to everyone, it should be possible to avoid being manifestly, that's to say patently and clearly, unfair to anyone. And hence the quirky title of the debate this evening, which is how not to run an unfair business. So the frame of mind sees acting fairly, the frame of mind that we would propose around purpose to benefit society sees acting fairly as a, not as a constraint, but as an aim. And it requires a clarity of purpose and consistency of having fair processes, treating people with dignity and respect, consulting and communicating the basis of decisions made, and also enabling a welcoming scrutiny. And it invites the difficult question also of what are we going to give up to become fairer? And most importantly, it needs careful thought if those who are affected by decisions, but whose voices are seldom heard or silent because they're distant communities or future generations are properly represented. And where structural problems impede acting fairly, businesses can use their agency together to advocate for change that benefits society rather than protecting self-interest. So our view would be that the key here is to keep looking through the human lens. Businesses are just people. The desire to build strong relationships of respect and care is deeply human. And building a business with that frame of mind helps turn a mere financial vehicle into a vibrant community who can help create a better society while delivering sustainable returns. So that's our argument. And let's see whether anybody agrees. Thank you, Charles. <coughs> yeah, feel free to applaud. <laughs> <laughs> So, so one question, uh, Charles, before I turn to Justin, which is one observation that is often made is that we have seen simultaneously 
an increase in talk around corporate social responsibility and initiatives around corporate social responsibility. Yeah. With two things, a pretty constant stream of corporate malfeasance, ranging from, you know, constant revelations about tech platforms to VW to the behavior of financial institutions leading up to 2008, but also a continuing decline in public trust towards business, particularly big business. I'm just interested in what your account is of how these things can be happening together, how it is we can be talking more and more about the need for corporate responsibility, whereas the behaviors and the public attitudes seem to be deteriorating, or at least not improving. Well, I think, so the two things actually, it's quite interesting that I think in the latest um, Edelman survey this, this year, trust in, of people in their own business has actually increased, which is, which is an interesting, how much... Um, in the business they work for, not in the one, business they work not the one for, they actually not the business, own. Not, not, yeah. Yeah, in the business they work for, which is, but it's itself, that's quite interesting, because I do think we all tend to, to think as a, as a, with a myopia about the business, the people I know I trust, but the institutions I don't. So we, there's that kind of feature of society. But I think one of the issues is displacement activity. So a CSR, at its best, is fantastic, but often has been seen as a displacement activity within organizations. And I think the way the markets work and divide our thinking, it's often creates situations in which, yes, we do all our good stuff over there, and we make all our money over here. And we live with this sort of um, very, very divided mind and a divided life. And I think the real provocation that's taking place now when people realize this, and more and more people are, is to say, well, hang on a minute, we have to come to these, bring these things together and ask the question, why is business there in the first place? How is it, how, how is it benefiting society through its core business? and to think about what we need to put in place to help achieve that. Which is why I think purpose becomes very important. But purpose can also be something that just gets used. And we talk about frictionless win-win. You had Anand Giritaradas here a little while ago, who's written a very impressive book on winners take all, making this argument that purpose itself is another way in which businesses can simply pretend to be changing while actually staying the same. And the, the, so the, the challenge is real, which is why I think fairness is such an important question to ask. Because fairness is about what you do, not just what you talk about. Thank you. So, uh, Justin, thinking both about your experience uh, as a, a, a boss, but also as an investor, I'm interested as to the extent to which you, you see fairness as being a good benchmark when one's looking at, at businesses and what they should be. Um, well, look, I, I find myself in a strange position because I agree with almost everything that Charles said. I absolutely agree with the thrust of what Charles said. And yet somehow I feel the word fair gets in the way of the wider debate because, you know, fairness is like beauty. It is in the eye of the beholder. And, and I find it is often a word that becomes a stick quite quickly with which to beat organisations. So... Um, you know, I'm sitting on a stage debating fairness as the idea, but I think personally the idea is somewhat different. If I can pick up uh, the point that you made about CSR, I've always had a problem with the S in CSR because it absolutely, in organisations, when they think of it as corporate social responsibility, my emphasis, but it is precisely displacement activity. It's what we do over here to make sure that we can't be criticised. One, one of the things that I often do with audiences when I talk on trust in business, I ask the audience, and I'll do it rhetorically now, do you think of yourself as being a good citizen? Well, of course, everybody does. I ask people to put in their minds a few words to summarise why they think of themselves as being a good citizen. They do. I then ask anyone who's brave enough to put their hand up if the words they have in their mind are, I obey the law. And as individuals, those are never the words. I think, that we have in our minds when we think of ourselves as good citizens. And yet they're almost always the first four words that corporations go to when explaining their behaviour. And you can think of that in the context of tax, for instance. Look, I think that we are undergoing the most profound reassessment of the role of commerce in society in 150 years. The mid to late Victorian era was the last time we saw as significant a change. Indeed, it's one of the reasons... Many of the brands that we know and trust and love today, retail brands, consumer brands, were founded in that era, an urbanising population detached from the ability to buy goods directly from producers, <coughs> needed brands, trustworthy intermediaries to help them trust the food. Sainsbury's, founded less than a mile from here, um, they put their name over the door, they said quality perfect, prices lower, and 
their business was born of milk adulteration scandals, uh, where milk had been adulterated with arsenic and was literally uh, killing people. Um, so I think it is as profound as that. I'm not sure that there is much evidence that corporate behavior has got materially worse in the last 5, 10, 15 years. These things tend to be progressive over time. But I think our ability to see it, to spot it, to hold it to account, to have conversations about it as consumers uh, greater than it's ever been. And I think that there have been a number of very high profile instances where businesses have wrapped themselves in clothes, which turned out not to be true. And if you think about the current debate about uh, the users of our data, uh, it's very focused on the big uh, international, largely American tech companies, but this is true more widely of corporations using data. People thought the deal when they handed over their data, if they realized that indeed is what they were doing, was very different from what they're now discovering the deal to be. That's very untrustworthy behavior on the part of the corporations that acquired that data. It's been acquired under false pretenses, I would argue, and it's been used against, not with, and for the consumer. So I prefer to think as the challenge being corporations having to work with the consent and support of the society and the communities that they serve. And that's much more about trust than it is about fairness, although, of course, behaving fairly undoubtedly leads to trust. But the nature of competitive business will always lead to unfair outcomes for some people. When a corporation makes a decision to make a number of people redundant, that will feel incredibly unfair to the individuals involved. Yet for the survival of the corporation, the, the wider group of people that work within it and the communities that that corporation serves, it might be the fairest decision, even though many of people impacted by it won't feel that it was fair. And that's why I find the word sometimes quite unhelpful uh, in arriving uh, at the right decision. But I think that the change is profound, and I think that this conversation is incredibly important. And I don't recognize the idea that corporations exist to maximize profit. I think that in the long run, if you do that, you will not maximize profit, you, because you will lose the ability to act either through the general consent of consumers or through legislation. Um, we've seen more corporate legislation in the last 10 to 15 years than in the previous 150 years. Now, if that doesn't tell you that the legislature, and the politicians have kind of worked out the only people held in lower esteem than them are business people. So <laughs> picking on business people is not a bad thing to do if you're a politician and held in pretty low esteem as a starting point too. Thanks, Justin. Um, What about the particular issue of um, investment and the fact that uh, uh, PLCs in particular, but not just PLCs, you know, uh, com companies held by private equity or whatever, where there is a gap between the company and the person running the company and those who are investing in the company. And increasingly, the, the notion, the sense that investment decisions aren't even driven by human beings, they're driven by algorithms. And that in a sense, therefore, the stewardship of these of, of, of companies is ambiguous at best, or arguably that there is no stewardship in a sense, that the people running the company are having to respond to the pressures which are generated by a kind of algorithmic machine demanding the maximization of returns. I mean, I'm sure that's a very simplistic view, but as someone who sat on the investor side of, who sits on the investor side of this now, tell me about the challenge of aligning investor incentives with good corporate practice. Well, look, I think it's difficult to generalize. Um, you know, I spent most of my working life in public companies, and much of the conversation around the subject gets focused tremendously on our public corporations. Um, and yet most of the uh, bad behavior, if you like, that uh, gets talked about uh, sits well beyond uh, our public uh, corporations. The, the relationship in, in public uh, corporations between management and investors um, is an odd one because we have no friction cost in share ownership in public companies anymore. A shareholder can buy today uh, and sell tomorrow. And indeed, many of the shareholders in our public companies are explicitly buying because they disagree with management and the strategy. You know, the rise of the 
activist investors. So the idea that there's this sort of homogenous mass called shareholders demanding of boards a particular type of behaviour is flawed fundamentally in public markets. And in those circumstances, I think it's beholden on management to be much more open, not just to shareholders, but to the wider constituency to which you must talk. Indeed, it's one of the reasons why I always agreed to do our results presentations on BBC television in the morning. Um, partly, of course, it fuels your ego, but um, a good bit of it was, you know, why would you miss an opportunity at 20 past seven to communicate directly with customers and colleagues in the business uh, via a platform for free from the BBC about what the business is achieving, why it's doing it, and how it's doing it. Um, so I think there is a communication responsibility there, which is, is deep and profound. As you move towards more private types of ownership, um, uh, that alignment's usually much clearer. In private equity, a business is bought on an investment thesis and management are employed to execute against that. And because you have a much tighter ownership model, there is a much um, uh, tighter relationship. And of course, many of our most successful businesses are privately held organizations with very long-term horizons. Uh, I started out working, and I guess it's partly where my value set comes from, for the Mars Corporation. It's still family owned, family run, and we had a 75 year business plan. And if you have a 75 year horizon on decision making, then the kind of issues that we're talking about must inevitably hove into view because they were thinking about this being a business that was being run for the benefit of their great-great-grandchildren. And if you'll think of it in those terms, you must, by definition, think about its wider relationship with society and the communities of which it's part, environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, and social sustainability too, without ever using those words. It's just inherent in the idea that you're thinking with a 75-year time horizon. If we come full circle back to public companies, often um, sort of falling at the altar of the next quarterly trading statement with a shareholding base that probably, if they all got in the room at the same time, couldn't agree what day of the week it is. That's a very different dynamic. Yeah, and I guess, sorry, uh, just to persist this for a second. I mean, my sense is that, you know, if you, if you run a, uh, if you're CEO of a company like you were at Sainsbury's, then you are involved al almost explicitly in recognizing that there is a balance to be struck between the demands of investors uh, to maximize profit, but also your loyalty to your customers, your loyalty to your workers, the loyalty to the communities that you serve. I guess my question is that if you are merely an investor, you don't have that loyalty. Your focus is upon the returns upon, uh, on the money invested. And, and that's the tension that I'm trying to... That that's I'm true, sure. but in a public company, as I said, investors can buy and sell uh, the shares at, at almost no friction cost. And, of course, they can buy themselves to a position to have a view, um, whether it be through asking for a seat on the board or ultimately um, buying more than 50% of the company and therefore controlling and uh, directing it. You know, clearly when you have a dispersed shareholder base, as we did in Saints, which is 120 or so thousand shareholders, uh, you're going to have you know, every view you could possibly have in the room. But that's where it comes back to communication and demonstrating that the decisions that you're taking are in the round for the well-being of the corporation. Uh, in, for, we announced our sponsorship at the Paralympics, um, heralded, uh, I think, largely with hindsight, as uh, an exceptional piece of corporate responsibility um, in 2009, for at least a year, if not longer, the only question I was ever asked by shareholders is why I was wasting the company's money on a flight of fancy. Um, and the answer was, because you don't understand our business, the colleagues that work in it, and the customers that we serve, and the communities of which we're part, and the things that our customers are worried about. If you think being involved in sponsoring the Paralympics is a bad idea, you just don't. And we, as the leadership of this organization, do. And we profoundly believe it's the right thing for the business to be doing. Now, eventually, that view changed. But it changed largely only when evidence was available. And that's why, in the end, it can't be. You think about algorithms, I couldn't disagree more. Because, ultimately, the decisions today that have the biggest delta for corporations, more than has ever been true, are those that are taken where the numbers can't take it for you. Because if you only take the decisions that numbers take for you, then ultimately you must lose. You have to be prepared to take decisions that have a point of view. That's why purpose 
is important because that's the definition of your point of view. And that's why values are important because they are, if you like, the signposts in that decision making, the ground on which you intend to tread and also the ground on which you will not tread. Thank you. Um, Baroness Honor O'Neill, I mean, you, you have a, a bit of a reputation for telling us that when we think about some of these issues, we are not thinking about it clearly. This is uh, what philosophers do, really, is they say, that's very interesting, but you're not really looking at this very consistently or clearly. When we talk about fairness and business and trust, are we thinking clearly? Well, I'd better live up to their reputation. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll make a comment on purpose, maybe a comment on fairness and a comment on trust. Okay. Why not? Um, purpose seems to me rather odd to assume that business, whether it be a corner shop or Sainsbury's, has one purpose. Surely most complicated institutions, and most of us in most of our lives, have a set of purposes. And I believe that once you recognise that there's a plurality of purposes, it does, as it were, become more realistic. And that's the sort of <coughs> decision that many of us face all the time in our institutional lives. If it's a business, it's absurd to think that the only purpose is the bottom line or shareholder value or maximising shareholder value. That, I know, is the Friedmanite take on economics, but uh, I would have thought that any business would have a plurality of purposes. It might, for example, be uh, to make affordable mortgages available in the East Midlands, perfectly respectable commercial purpose. But... The question is, what are the purposes? And they aren't just the bottom line and maximising. But then, I think there are some purposes that any business must have, which are, if you like, public purposes, not just private purposes. And I think that because businesses get some very remarkable public benefits in return for which they owe something. The most obvious benefit that businesses get under uh, our legislation, and for a couple of centuries, is limited liability. When your business goes bust, you don't have to sell your house. That's what that means. It's really important to people. And that, I think, is a, a major benefit. Um, I've recently spent three years on the Banking Standards Board, and that made me think quite a lot about the additional public privileges that banks get. If you think about 2008 and being bailed out by the public purse, you'll know what I mean. So it seems to me lots of purposes, some of them the purposes <coughs> of the business, some of them public purposes, all important, and it's in most things in life you have to try to um, bring them together. What about CSR? Well, uh, I'm going to be rather rude here. CSR is very nice, but I'm reminded, as you've already introduced Groucho Marx, I'll go back to Groucho Marx. He said, um, I have principles, <laughs> and if you don't like them, I have some others. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm afraid um, that um, that's the sort of gesture we make with CSR. Don't get me wrong, CSR can do very good things, but CSR is not a matter of taking the public purposes of the business seriously. It's much narrower than that, and in uh, certain hands it has been reduced to cosmetic, um, which is a pity, because it can be more serious. Now something about trust. I actually don't think trust is the important thing. I think trustworthiness is the important thing. And uh, trustworthiness, uh, of course, we hope, is something that people recognise and then they trust you. They don't always. Sometimes trustworthy people are mistrusted. Sometimes, more significantly, untrustworthy people are trusted. And that's a, a pretty bad news. But I do think we need to think about trustworthiness much more than about trust. Trust is a reputational category. And that is why, of course, for certain sorts of business purposes and other purposes, getting a pollster to discover how much people trust you can seem very valuable and very reasonable and you can pay for it. And actually, when you look at the poll, ev polling evidence, it's nothing like what people say it is. On the whole, the people who were trusted quite a lot, 
20 years ago are still trusted. In this country, judges and nurses very much trusted, and they were. And who's mistrusted? Well, it's always the politicians and the journalists who come out low, um, and of course, second-hand car salesmen, perhaps even lower. Uh, so, um, a reputational metric doesn't have to shadow or even deal with the question of whether the reputation's earned. You can do your uh, in, uh, polling to discover who's trusted, uh, and you uh, won't discover anything about who's trustworthy, which is a bit of a pity. Um, now, you might say you can't fool all of the people all of the time, and that's perfectly true. So probably there's a little bit of evidence in being mistrusted, being an indicator that you might be untrustworthy, but it's not far from perfect. So I don't hold that we can learn a great deal from the metrics. Let me now change, turn to fairness, because I said I'd say something about that too. Um, when I was talking with Charles just before we came in, I, I uh, pointed out to him that uh, probably the best known pl uh, political philosopher of the last 50 years, who was actually my doctoral supervisor, Jack Rawls at Harvard, um, called his work or his book Justice as Fairness. Um, and uh, it's why did he think fairness was part of justice? And the answer that he gave, which um, I think is compelling, is you can't think of justice as merely a matter of claimable rights. We tend to nowadays because we take uh, human rights standards very seriously. But fairness is one of those categories that it cannot be uh, reduced to a human right, a right to be fairly treated sounds a bit odd, doesn't it? But the reason that it can't is, I think, quite compelling that um, a right has to be claimable. Fairness is, on the whole, about the relativity between the way different parties are treated. So that if you have a lot of customers, and some of them get far better biscuits for their money than others who bought the same biscuits, sorry for the grocery example, Justin. <laughs> um, if you do that, would be, people would say it was unfair. But Charles's distinction between um, fair process and fair results matters. And I think fair process is something that we take really seriously. And that's something that we also think um, legislation and court procedure has got to achieve is fair process. But it doesn't necessarily achieve fair results. And the idea of fair results is highly ambiguous. Some people are inclined to say that fair results mean the same sort of treatment for each social group. So you have as many men as we have women on your, on your staff, and as many men as women who are earning more than 20K, and so on. I think that's a hiding to nothing because people actually do choose to do different things. And when people say it's terribly unfair that there are so few women judges, I might agree, but if so, I've got to say it's fair for, unfair for some reason, but not just because of the statistics. Or I would have to say it's terribly unfair that more women than men are primary school teachers, which, by the way, they are. And so I leave you with that question. Why is it unfair if there are different proportions of people to, in a different line of work? And my own guess is that that's a pretty, that sort of proportionate model of fairness is probably not, in the end, very reliable. It gives you bizarre results as soon as you push it into the interstices. Thank you. To what extent do you think that when we have, we have this conversation about trust and fairness and we put people like you know, Justin in the frame and, and, and ask him challenging questions, but you know, some of this is about us, isn't it? It's about the fact that we want to transfer our own dilemmas. So we, I suspect many people in the room are guilty, as I am, of the, uh, uh, of the, kind of the guilty Amazon purchase late at night. We don't really like Amazon as a company. We're worried that you know, in 10 years' time, every single person will work for Amazon. Um, <laughs> But yet it's half past 11 and we've forgotten somebody's birthday and you know, we know it'll be packed in a warehouse by somebody miserable with a device strapped around their ankle, but you know, where else are we going to get the gift? 
more broadly, as I'm sure Justin will confirm, people say, well, Sainsbury's have got to be fair, but at the same time, I want the cheapest, you know, spuds I can get. <laughs> T to what extent are we <coughs> placing onto the burden, onto the shoulders of business leaders, our own unresolved <coughs> expectations about what business should do? I think you're projecting a certain economic theory on, on the average purchase of potatoes. When I, <laughs> when I buy potatoes, I absolutely do not look for the, 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 the very cheapest potatoes. Ah. I have reasons for not looking for the very cheapest potatoes. They take longer to peel. Some of them might be rotten. Um, all sorts of reasons. So I don't think it's the case any more than we have a, a business having a single purpose, that you as the customer have just one purpose, which is to minimize the cost to you. Or if you do, you are a, in one sense a model customer and in another sense an absolutely terrifying customer. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, so uh, Jane, you are, Jane Corbett, you're, you're a member, you're in a kind of two-by-two two matrix. You are a kind of doubly trusted person, because not only are you a local politician, who are, of course, much, much more poli uh, trusted than national politicians. You're ramping up the... Anti but you're also, anti you're also a Liverpudlian. Of course, Liverpudlians are trusted no. more than any other uh, group of citizens. <laughs> I'm, uh, okay. uh, fairness is a really big issue for Liverpool and for you. Tell us what you're okay. doing about that, and tell us the role the business is playing in, in what you're doing. Okay. So I've actually lived in Liverpool for about 42 years now. I was born in London, but I learned my real fairness about the systems and how unfair systems can be in the city. So when I was growing up, my mum and dad didn't talk about politics at all, which was really interesting, given that they were both Christians, um, which is a whole different issue itself. Um, so for me, I arrived in Liverpool age 17, helped out the play scheme, um, went back because I loved it because it was a community that actually welcomed its, its arm and said, come in girl, you're all right, you're one of us, yeah. which is unbelievable for, for a city and for Liverpool, it's typical Liverpool. Uh, so then if you jump to, okay, Scousers don't buy the sun, let's be a bit provocative here, is that fair? Yes, it is. Why? Because of Hillsborough. So that whole history there, that is a statement and, and, and Liverpool people are very proud to say that. <coughs> No, we don't, and, you know, Billy Bragg's a good song about it. Okay, jumping forward then sideways, let's look at Sainsbury's. So, bad decisions made in the mid-80s in, in the community that I've lived in for a long time now, for over 40 years. We were out without a supermarket on Great Home Street, known as Gracie, for 25 years. I remember us as a little community group, way well before I was a, 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 a councillor, writing to Sainsbury's because we thought that they were one of the fairest supermarkets around. Interesting. Why? Part of the fair trade stuff, Justin. Whatever people think about fair trade, you know, we, I think Sainsbury's was the first supermarket to put fair trade in there for bananas and coffee and everything else. Um, and we kept going. We said, look, we are, we've been crashed to bits in our community. A lot of people have just been thrown out. They've been told you can't come back. Housing was bad. You haven't got a choice to stay. So when we went to Sainsbury's and said, please, can you help us out and build a supermarket? Because we are without shops on our main drag here. We can't get to shops. And they said, no, no, we can't, we can't do that because you haven't got enough people in the area. So we had this backwards and forwards. Now, Sainsbury's then made a risky, and I think it was a risky, but it was a sound, and it's proven to be sound decision, to actually build a supermarket on Great Owner Street. And that got opened two years ago. That's after 25 years of fighting, putting the, the, you know, the, the, the housing back in place, putting all the, 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 all the routes back in place. So then you say, okay, um, is that fair to the other shops further up the road, right, right up the road, about a mile away? Well, actually, yes, because Sainsbury's picked the right size. Okay, so that, that's a fair decision. What about um, targeting local people for jobs? You could say, well, hang on a minute, what about everybody else in Liverpool? Why are you just targeting a certain percentage of people in Everton and Vauxhall to Sainsbury's. Fair decision, because we've been without jobs and we have a very, very high un unemployment rate. What about building up then the impact? You look at the impact on that. And CSR, I think, see, I, I see CSR as the cherry on the cake and the cake hasn't got any eggs in. <laughs> Actually, you know, looking at purpose, it's, 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 it's the, the, the stick of Blackpool rock. You cut it anywhere and you've got the purpose running right through the middle. So Chris, the manager, 
Um, he's now taken early retirement. Absolutely brilliant. He was a regional manager for Shamesbury. He decided to come to Gracie and to set it up. And he was really <coughs> fair in how he treated people. He gave them good interviews. He promised interviews to people. He worked with them. He listened to where they were up to. Now, when you go to Gra when you go down to Gracie to Sainsbury's, that's where the community meets. There's a little cafe there. It's all decent, decent stuff in there. Fair trade coffee, tea. People are paid a decent wage. So I go down and I see half the community down there. They're either working there or they're meeting there or they're having a cup of tea. So actually, Sainsbury's has created that, but that took an awful... They didn't say, well, oh, we'd love to do it for you. We had to fight tooth and nail, but we got there. But then jump sideways to my mate Jack, who, uh, when he did his writing for me and his drawings, he was eight, and that was four years ago. And uh, he was found by his mother in the corner of the room, they were living in private landlord accommodation, uh, the electricity kept sparking uh, because the standard of the accommodation was absolutely appalling and they were getting loads of housing benefit from, from them and the mother, it really is not well enough to work at all. Um, and she found him in the corner peeling the wallpaper off, the, picking at the wallpaper because they hadn't got any money for food, right? Now, is that fair? Of course it's not. So it was either keep warm or don't have food and that night they said we're going to keep warm but we're not going to have food. And I talked to her and I said, how do you manage the emotions of your child? Because this, the, the, the thing about poverty is it can go in completely, or, and it's very unfair because for years then you're living with that, or it goes out and you become very angry and then you can be stopped by the police and put inside. So how do you manage the emotions of your child? I said, is he any good at drawing? Does he like writing little bits and pieces down? And she said, he's, he's a great artist. So I said, would he draw me things and, and write things down? And she said, I'll ask him. And he said, tell Jane I will do as long as it helps other kids in Liverpool. <laughs> so he does. Um, and he writes me things and he drew, drew a picture about, do you see food? And it was an empty plate. Um, but then he wrote this quote and he said, this is for you. And it said, listen to me, you're grown-ups. This is bad. You are being bad unless you do something with a K about it. Now, I use that wherever I go, and I will text um, my little mate Jack afterwards um, to his mother and say, tell him we used it tonight. And he will always say, did it make any difference? So in terms of Jack and in terms of Sainsbury's and in terms of, and I'll stop now, don't worry, in terms of universal credit. So you go back to what Charles said about what mindset of people got when they're making decisions. What mindset does the government have, DWP have, uh, local job centres have? in terms of universal credit and how that's worked. So 24 changes to welfare reform, squash them into a box, call it universal credit, push it out. Terrifying, absolutely terrifying. On top of that, uh, cut the councils, local authorities, and say, well, you're going to have to look after that. So you're in a situation where there is a, a, a storm of unfairness and linking up with what Honora said before, look at the justice element on that. And in the middle of that, Liverpool is trying to do a whole project around fairness, working with Blueprint. And what we do is we use the five principles. So I go around with, I've got loads of these, look, look it up on the web because it's really useful. So whether it's a big business, whether it's university, whether it's the local coffee shop, whether it's the construction company that's just setting up, I go through these principles, say, what are you doing? Oh, they say, oh, we love this. Yeah, we operate true to a purpose that serves society respects the dignity of people, and so generates a fair return for responsible investors. I mean, just imagine if, you know, even half of the, uh, of the businesses, the organisations, the groups across the country work to that. Happy days? Sorted. So for me, blueprint principles, all of those big five on that page, which has got people like Honora feeding into that with all the philosophy and background on that, and all the evidence that Charles come up with about economic theory, that is really solid, and that's our <coughs> foundations. We've got that in our procurement strategy, we've got that in our fair city policy, we've got that in our inclusive growth plan. Now, we're nowhere near getting it right, but we are moving in the right direction, and we're doing it together, which is, which is another thing about building up trust. Thank you, Jane. So, Jane, I hope this isn't an unfair question, but recently, with a lot of publicity, mm. um, New York turned down Amazon arriving. And this was, of course, led by AOC, you know, one of the most charismatic young politicians, radical politicians in the States. Regardless of that, 
if a company said it would invest in Liverpool, big time, but it was pretty clear that it wouldn't get five ticks on your well, it chart. Get, it might get three. It might be saying we'd like to look at the other two. What we'd would, like to have a discussion. But if in the end they didn't satisfy you on fairness, would you say you're unwelcome in Liverpool? Okay, if together, I would discuss this together. Okay, so we have groups and we do, and we have a whole brand of calling come together for a fairer future. And I would say, what do you, what do you think? And people might say, do you know what? Amazon, they're not, they're stuck. They're not moving in the right direction. In fact, they're getting worse. Are they paying taxes? Are they going to benefit the city? Uh, are they going to pay us proper business rates? Are they going to try and work around the back door? Are they just, why are they coming to Liverpool? Uh, well, because they, we, we've got people there that might, are so desperate that they might work for them. Okay, are, are they going to train people up? What are their terms and conditions like? Have they moved forward? So, for example, Blueprint working for Vodafone. I haven't... I stopped having a SIM on my phone from Vodafone a long time ago. And I remember saying to Charles, are you working with Vodafone? And he said, yeah, we're on a journey. Now, if Vodafone is on a journey, then, then I might well buy my SIM back from Vodafone. But if Amazon isn't on a journey in the right direction, no, I wouldn't want them anywhere near us. Now, you then have to weigh that up and say, hang on a minute, <coughs> how is that going to work in Liverpool? The fact that two-thirds of children in poverty in Liverpool are from families who are in work, are we actually just tipping people into poverty? And then, of course, you know, UN Rapporteur for Extreme Poverty and Human Rights comes to the, comes to the UK and says this is appalling. So those are the sorts of discussions. Uh, so I, I could spend the entire uh, time, in fact, I could spend all night really talking to these four people, but um, that would be abusing my position. <laughs> uh, and Blueprint are paying for the wine, so I better stick to the rules. Uh, I've noticed, by the way, we've talked about cakes, potatoes, eggs, and cherries so far. So clearly, Justin, your presence on the panel is uh, having a subliminal and effect. And shops. A uh, subliminal shops. effect on, on the metaphors that we're using. I'm just going to ask you one question, and, and um, uh, don't feel the need to answer it, but uh, we've never seen corporations, arguably, in the history uh, as powerful as Facebook, as powerful as Google, as powerful as Amazon. And we have seen, certainly from Facebook and Google, that this power has not led them to recognize that they have an even higher requirement in terms of responsibility. But we have seen, you know, an attempt to hide the business model, an attempt to not come clean about problems which they knew about. Um, is there fundamentally a problem about corporations having that much power, regardless? I mean, I've, I've said that they haven't acted in the right way, but even if they were run by saints, is there fundamentally a, power about, a problem about any corporation having that much power? Charles? Well, I think what we're dealing with is the emergence of, natural, of, of monopolies. So there is a concentration of monopoly power. Uh, and my view is that they will need to be regulated, they will need to be broken up. I mean, there is a, there is a weakness of there's antitrust. A between regulation and breaking up. Well, well there's, there's a, yes, but the way, as I understand it, the, the antitrust law in the States has developed in recent decades makes it much harder to break these businesses up. But, but I think the monopoly power that, that, that is there, because of the network effects of platforms that become universal, does create a societal problem which will have to be addressed politically. So, uh, fairness, in a sense, is not... I mean, it, the values of the people who run those corporations are not enough because you're agreeing in a sense their power is so great that there's a kind of structural change. Adjustment. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that we live, we live in a world where the, that there is actually generally a lack of countervailing powers. So we have weak government, weak trade unions, which is another big factor in all of this, mm. and very, very strong, powerful corporations, not just the tech giants, but a lot of other companies have got enormous power. And I think part of you know, the push in our paper is to invite businesses to recognize that and voluntarily put in place as the best companies are beginning to do, much, much better forms of accountability. So they know they, they need to be held to account. The law and regulation doesn't require them to, so they want to put themselves on a better footing with society so, that, so they are putting in place better ways of trying to do that. But I do think where you've, got, where you've got these incredibly powerful monopolies that are emerging, I think regulatory solutions, legal solutions, have to play a part. Justin? Yeah, I, I think absolutely regulation has to play a part. I'm not sure there's, there's a leap to breaking up, which is, yeah. seems to me to be potentially entirely counterproductive. I, I don't agree with your central assertion. I mean, the Dutch East India Company was a much okay. larger proportion of the world's economic system at the height of its powers, and 
friend of mine bought the company. For, it did some quite dodgy stuff as well. It did some it? very <laughs> dodgy stuff. Um, what was that TV series last year, um, if you watched it? Uh, but a friend of mine, 10 years ago, bought the name off the shelf for £1,000. So, right. um, you know, time changes. Um, what does he sell? Tea. All right, okay. Yeah. Well, I can add that to the list then. <laughs> Cakes, potatoes, eggs, <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but um, so, you know, clearly, monopolistic power uh, will almost inevitably be used against the grain of society's consent and therefore the whole point of having states and in our system elected um, uh, governments is that they have a right to intervene in that and they should. Uh, the problem is they tend to arrive a bit late and I think if you look at the debates happening at the moment um, it's been as plain as the nose on as the front of your face for a long period of time that action is going to be necessary, but the state's only catching up. I mean, one of the most surreal things that happened to us um, in this regard, um, Amazon's already been mentioned, and you asked the, the, the question about Liverpool. Well, um, the Scottish uh, government about, um, I guess it's about 10 or 12 years ago now, raised a supplementary business rate on all retailers of over 30,000 square feet, essentially grocery mm -hmm. retailers, therefore, so that it could subsidize Amazon to build a warehouse um, and not pay any rates in Scotland. I mean, it, uh, thank you for the gentleman you laughing it up. there. Um, it felt funny at the time, and of course, <laughs> looking back, it really does look funny, but at the time, it was, it was sort of serious economic policy. So, yes, the state must intervene. I think you're seeing the appointment of Nick Clegg, for example, is clearly an indication that they recognise they need to do something. But my experience of these, uh, these corporations is that they, are, they don't get it yet. They genuinely believe that they've changed the paradigm of the way corporations interact with society. There are some huge benefits from single platforms, open source, uh, uh, you know, the, the number of apps that are developed as a result of uh, the open source uh, process that you have there. But ultimately, data is being acquired and used against us, not for us. I mean, when you boil it down, fundamentally, our data is being used uh, against us. And that cannot be a good thing and, and can't uh, persist. Yeah, but but, and I should say as well, though, there's a really important thing here, which is, and, and it's to your question, by the way, of the dirty secret of the Amazon order late at night. You know, we are, as individuals, incredibly powerful in this regard. Um, there's a thing called a wallet, and how we choose to spend it makes a difference. And it's so important in this narrative that, that we don't all think that the solution has to lie in the government legislating. If you remember the debate a few years ago about Starbucks and their tax position, um, and they eventually announced, which I still find slightly surreal, that they would voluntarily pay tax. Mm. Um, nice than that. Uh, yeah, well, Trying another think. debate, perhaps. I think you get a muffin with it as well. But what, what fundamentally caused that change was not the fury in the Daily Mail and politicians thumping the table. It was within a couple of weeks, their sales were off 15%. Mm. And corporations react to their sales being off 15%. They do. Um, and so they changed. Because in the end, consumers had a choice. They were looking at a high street with a cost of coffee, um, which they perceived to be a British tax-paying company, sitting alongside Starbucks, which they perceived to be an American non-tax-paying company. Both sold brown warm water, uh, with some taste preference, you might argue, for two seventy nine a cup. And so you could choose to pay your two seventy nine and have tax paid or not. But when you offer the consumer the benefit of the tax saving or the benefit of the appalling employment practice, which is the mm. essence of your Amazon observation, a lot of consumers say, I'll take that deal. In a way, it's no different when a workman says to you, £100 for cash or 120 if you want an invoice. Mm. And, you know, I'm not going to ask or embarrass anyone, but I'll be the first to admit that's a very tempting offer when you get it from uh, a, a workman, is it not? Because you're being given the opportunity to disintermediate the tax man and share in the benefit thereof. And that's really just a micro version of what we're talking about. Uh, uh, Nora, can I just ask you this? So, can I just ask you about this question about 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 power, just from a kind of philosopher's perspective, which is that it, the idea that 
in a sense, it doesn't matter how much power somebody's got as long as their morals are okay. There'd be another view that says, no, it, that isn't really how, that, that actually the, the argument for the restraint of power exists regardless of the morality of those people who possess the power. Would you concur with that? Well, I, I do notice that um, uh, the tech companies, the big tech companies, are rather in favour of self-regulation, yes. which is essentially to say uh, we don't want to encounter power. But uh, I fear we're in a situation where the power of the states to regulate them is much less than we might like to think. Uh, they, um, there is a reason why uh, Google Europe is headquartered in Dublin and Amazon Europe in Luxembourg. And the answer is that they make a lot of profit in other jurisdictions, uh, but they pay their taxes in Luxembourg and the Republic of Ireland, um, and uh, who give them a goodish deal. So uh, I think globalization has created a, a very different situation from the one we would have seen a few decades ago where you paid your taxes in the jurisdiction where you did your business. And uh, I don't know the remedy to this one, but I think it is now a very serious problem and offshoring is all over the place and uh, if we can't solve that one, it's really um, sort of whistling in the dark to say, would the, uh, the various states, the democratic states, anyhow, please regulate these businesses? Equally, it's whistling in the dark to say, would they perhaps use antitrust powers, as was do done in early 20th century America, to break up concentrations of economic power? No, they won't. And not because they might not like to, but because it, it is too difficult, too threatening, and their powers may not be great enough. So we've got to try to work out solutions that will work, even where state power is no longer adequate to do it. Finally, with you, Jamie, before I open up to the room, um, a, a good friend of Liverpool, Michael Heseltine, um, has been wont to say that one of the problems in our economy is that we centralised in London. And so... You know, when you're in Liverpool and you're talking to companies, very few of those companies are headquartered in Liverpool. Some of them aren't headquartered in the UK at all. I remember <coughs> talking to the leader of Southampton, wanting to talk to the people who own the docks. Well, the people who own the docks were Chinese, you know. And so talking to the people who own the docks about the role the docks played in Southampton's regeneration, it was taking literally years to get through to the people who had the power. Yeah. Yeah. Is this an issue for you yeah. that, that, that you can't even have the conversations you want to have with businesses because they're just not there? I think, there's, I think there's an issue about the, uh, the more concentration of power, the higher the risk in terms of abuse of power. The more, I, 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 I can, I'm lucky enough to live on the edge of the city centre, so it takes me about 20 minutes to walk straight in. I know when I walk along, several people will say, all right, Jane, how's it going? And I, I'm, and I go, so I'm, I'm held accountable by the local community that will say to me, what's happening, where are you up to? I'm held accountable by the council and members that we have public open meetings, I'm held, I, I re report to, for scrutiny every six weeks. They will say to me, how are you doing with all of this fairness stuff? Once you get a disconnect between, so it goes back to what Charles was saying about relationships and the relational aspect of all of this. Once that is no longer in place and you can't get at people, whether it's, actually some people can be the other side of the world, but you can have really good discussions with them and you can, you can be in contact with them. I think if the concentration of power means that you disconnect from the, from the people that you are here to serve, because we're serving society, that's when the danger comes in. So concentration of power, whether it's political, whether it's faith-based, whether it's businesses, because businesses are and can be such a force for good, it's untrue. It's, I think sometimes, I mean, I, I remember seeing, talking to a, a, a woman in Lush and said to them, Look, you know on your windows in Los, you ought to be saying, we pay our taxes in big... Oh, no, we couldn't, couldn't do that. No, please. Why not? <laughs> Say it loud. You know, be proud of paying taxes. We pay our taxes. People go, I'd like to go and buy there. So the thing that we've got in Liverpool going, which, which we will get to, is imagine all the, the, um, the ships coming to the, to the cruise liners terminal, OK? You're coming in from America, you're landing in, in off, get, getting off the cruise liner, and you're thinking... We might have a, a, a night in Liverpool and a day, and we'll see what happens. Where do you want to stay in a hotel? If you could look up, and we're not there yet, but we will be, if you could look up on a, on a website and say, which of these hotels are linked up with the Fair City Forum? 
Okay, so you get it and you see the five principles and you say, oh, okay, so what are they doing about that? This isn't a charter mark, this is like, well, we actually pay a real living wage. Really? What's your terms and conditions like? Not too bad, actually. We don't use zero-hours contracts unless we're doing stuff together. Okay. Uh, what's the union? Right, okay. Do you source, we, we source all our food coming in through our chefs from local... So you start to get a picture, you go, I'd like to go there. So it goes back to, to Justin's point about where does your money go? It, and, and then it's competing with fairness, competing with justice, competing with all of that. And that, that starts to do what Blueprint called a race to the top. Thank you. Um, so what we're going to do, uh, folks, is take as many points as we can over the next kind of 10 minutes or so. And I'm just going to ask you, panel, to, to listen to all these points. Um, and then I'm going to give you a minute each to just pick a couple of the points that you've heard that you want to specifically respond to, okay? So uh, who's going to go first? Um, and please keep them as short as you can, but do tell us your name when you start to speak. There's two hands up there we'll start with. I'll wait for the microphone to come to you. Thank you. So hello, Charles and Matthew. Timothy Henry, one of the co-founders of Conscious Capitalism and a re recent author of a book on that topic. So one of the things we deal with in the conscious capitalism framework is this notion of time and fairness, in particular as you think about stakeholders and fairness, you can at one hand have very short-term transactional relationships and at the other hand have very long-term relational kind of relationships. And I'm curious how you think about reconciling the notion of fairness with the time horizon that you look at through which it is fair. Short-term fairness versus mid-term versus long-term fairness and how that plays into this discussion. Thank you. And then behind you, I think. Hi, Alamia. Um, just a question. We talked about uh, how consumers can put pressure on businesses to change, which is fine when it's a consumer-facing business, but what about uh, business to business? What uh, pressure can we exert there? Great, thank you. Supply chains. Uh, there's a hand here. I'm going to go across the room and they're back again. Um, Nicholas Beale from SciTeb. Charles, you mentioned the three aspects of fairness and the frame of mind in which you took the decision you suggested might be the most important. But we seem to have seen a lot of instances where people, because they feel they're virtuous, they're working for a charity, a, a, a business that's a plucky little upstart even though it's now a multi-billion corporation, they seem to be able to take what others would see as very unfair decisions because they feel that they're sort of the good guys. And don't we have to be a little bit cautious about a situation where we feel we've done the right frame of mind if in fact the outcome is unfair and the processes are unfair? Okay, and then here, and then there's two more over there. Uh, Phil Hall from Association of Accounting Technicians. Justin, completely take your point about the two cups of coffee at £2.79. Um, relatively simple choice. What happens, however, where you get a flight to Lisbon uh, for £30 with a company that treats its staff appallingly, its customers very unfairly? Uh, against and Gloria's in it. A, you know, Ryanair. No, oh, well, I didn't possibly. Ryanair. <laughs> I and then you've got you British Airways, on the other hand, very responsible company, but it's charging £250. Um, your average consumer actually doesn't mind being treated unfairly for a short period of time if they're that price sensitive. Okay, we'll go over there. I find those £30 flights very hard to get there, you know. Um... Uh, Justin suggested that it was laugh... Oh, sorry. sorry, Paul Lee. Um, Justin suggested it was laughable that uh, Starbucks should volunteer to pay tax. But, but isn't tax in practice pretty much voluntary for, for corporations? They can structure themselves to, to minimize or, or to reach pretty much zero. Um, don't we need them to, to volunteer to, to pay tax to, to be good citizens of, of our nations? Yep. John Bryant, I used to be the chair of the Health Scrutiny Committee in Camden. And one of the problems we had at the, um, when I was uh, involved there for, for six years was the processes which were not fair, which we were trying to scrutinise. For example, the letting of public procurement contracts for new health service provision in the borough, we were not allowed to suggest that cooperatives should be given preference, or that those particular companies which had good uh, patient satisfaction rates should be given priority. 
the rules said those which had best value for money, which tended to be American companies, would get the contract. And even though we, as procurement commissioners from the council, wanted to vary the rules to allow other types of organisation to get a look in, we weren't allowed. So fairness in processes are government-led and they should be changed. Uh, yes, I, there's one here and then I'm only taking women uh, just because the uh, proportions have been a bit out of kilter and then maybe two more and then we'll finish. Yeah. Tom Levitt, I'm author of a book called The Company Citizen. I think both uh, Justin and Charles uh, reached the conclusion that the way to put the values that are leading, leading to fairness and the other positive values into effect is essentially through long-term planning and long-term goals. Uh, and great respect for companies like Unilever who have scrapped their quarterly reporting. But why uh, have so few other companies scrapped quarterly reporting? Why is it still the touchstone which I believe acts against uh, bringing in all of these uh, values on a scale that's necessary. Yep, and then uh, here, and then over there. And then that's, we'll bring you back in panel, but you have to pick one or two points. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my name is Liliana Pop, I'm a fellow here. I just wondered whether you would be interested in making this kind of argument where you link fairness with other more kind of substantive um, objectives. Say, you could argue along the lines of Fairness is good for business, fairness is good for saving the environment, fairness is good for resilience, for countering um, concentration and monopolies and so on. It seems to me that on its own, fairness can sound vague, but if you link it to something that people really want as a means to that end, uh, that could be interesting. And, uh, and there's a fair way to do to argue, I think, all of these things, that fairness is a really good way of achieving. Thank you. Stuff. And then, yeah. Hi, uh, Joe Alexander from Share Action. I was wondering what the panel thought about um, the fairness of expecting business to be a change agent uh, in when they maybe haven't been expected to be over the past decades and now we are requiring change. Um, it may feel internally within a company that that's unfair. Um, and I, I wonder if that holds us back and what we're going to do about it. Thank you. Great questions. Uh, we're going to do it in reverse order. So, Jane, just pick uh, one or two of those. Okay. Share action. I wondered if someone from Share Action will be here. Um, I love that you, because you, you, you go into AGMs and you challenge, and, and it's positive challenge and it's thoughtful challenge, and you buy some shares so you've got a right to be there. Um, and I think that holding, holding everybody, including you know, politicians, businesses, small businesses, you know, some, some SMEs and even some charities and not-for-profits, you know, let's not be naive here. Let's check them out. Really check them out because some of the biggest businesses actually can be the, the, the biggest forces for good. So don't just go there and think, oh, because they're an SME or, or because they're a micro they're entrepreneur, or they're, they're not-for-profit, therefore they must be okay. Check it out. But in terms of share action, I think that, that whole holding, holding each other to account because we're part of a society that is there for everybody. And if it works for everybody, it also works for me. So if you go to the Wilkinson Pickett research, uh, which was in the Cape Pickett about income inequality, trust breaks down when you've got massive inequality. And people are judged on what they earn and what they own. So if, you earn, so if you're judged on that and you're very status sensitive, including people on the highest, you know, why are people buying yachts? What do you need a yacht for? Every say, you know, so, so let's challenge each other and say, okay, let's look at that. The other one was the time question. I think that's a really interesting one because time fits into long-term planning, medium-term planning, for example. And the longer you're thinking, Justin, about long-term planning and looking at, really looking at very, very long-term, but also people's time is precious. So as soon as people get paid a very, very low wage and they're running on making, you know, 50 hours, 60 hours each week, they then lose their contact with their family, their, their grandchildren. They haven't got, let, let alone money in their pocket to, to spend locally. But that whole issue of time and then what you do with that. Last thing, chronic stress and anxiety is massive. So lack of power and control plus, lack of power and control plus unpredictability equals chronic stress and anxiety. One of the top guys in, in health in Scotland said, and absolutely spot on. So that, that fits in with that as well. Thank you. Manor? Um, 
I think this picks up several comments that were on value for money and on accountability. Um, there are powerful forms of accountability, but there are also very destructive mm. and time-consuming forms of accountability. Uh, forms of accountability where people find themselves spending their lives filling forms. Or, and I suppose that you know, if I had a magic wand, I might uh, wave a magic wand to abolish off an awful lot of uh, satisfaction questionnaires and <laughs> metrics. Uh, I might wave a magic wand to an, um, abolish quite a lot of process. But the problem is that some of it is needed. Yeah. That is to say, uh, simply saying, well, let's uh, as trust people to do the right thing won't work either. So. Uh, if I had a complicated, slow, long, difficult agenda, but maybe you can do it, it would be combing through the forms of accountability that we have constructed, mainly for other people, which eat time and don't achieve the results that they were there to achieve. Thank you. Justin. Um, look, three things to pick up. The, the, the comment about supply chains. You, you can only hold to account the person with whom you are treating and therefore you have to hold them to the account for the supply chain that they represent. We're seeing many of these tech companies essentially pretend that they don't represent a supply chain. Uh, look at Just Eat recently said that they uh, were going to start taking responsibility for the quality of the food that they connect you with. Um, that seems to me an interesting revelation. That means thus far they don't think um, the quality of the food they connect with is anything to do with them. So I think you have to hold the person with whom, with whom you treat accountable for their supply chain, and it's never been easier to do that than it is today, and it's only going to get easier going forward. And the opportunity for corporations to demonstrate that, whether it be Lush uh, painting uh, something on their window or through uh, their website or apps that they'll provide you with that will give you access to what that corporation is doing on your behalf in the supply chain to represent you. The, the second thing I'd say is... Um, you know, the, the, to the point about, um, I, I guess, tax and, and more widely um, uh, the, the, the conversation about internationalisation is, you know, the point I made about S Starbucks was just a moment in time. There was this juxtaposition that they weren't paying tax in the UK because they uh, argued quite legitimately that they weren't making any profit in the UK, yet uh, were reporting as a corporation in America that the UK was one of the most profitable development markets in the world. And that seemed a somewhat difficult juxtaposition. <laughs> Hence why they then said, well, we'll voluntarily pay tax. Because it, they really had a mirror held up to the ludicrousness of the position uh, they were, were arguing for. But let's be clear, the only people who pay tax are us, citizens. Corporations don't pay taxes. They, they don't. Um, ultimately, every single tax dollar that a corporation pays is recovered from you one way or another in the price of the goods that you pay for. And so, in the end, we are powerful in this. And corporation tax, as the Baroness um, highlighted, is going to be problematic going forward with international corporations. But by far the biggest tax burden, if you look at the company you're dealing with in the UK, are the taxes that they pay related to employment. That's why zero-hours contracts and all the other bad employment practices have come into being because that disintermediates the tax system. The business rate system, which taxes only the use of property in the pursuit of economic activity and not the other things uh, that it might uh, also tax. So there are much bigger tax dollars. And in the reason that Amazon can charge you less for the same mm. good is broadly their tax burden because of their business model is lower. Of course. That's the reality. And so you're participating when you place that order. And so to the final question that was sort of in the middle here, you know, is it, is it right to hold a corporation to account for this, this change? Uh, absolutely it is. I think the you know, Baron has touched on this right at the start. Um, and it goes back to the mid-Victorian era. The idea of a limited liability company came into existence to change the compact between corporations and society. And many corporations have forgotten that part of the deal. We have this wonderful opportunity that if we get it wrong and go bust, we, the leaders of those corporations, don't go to debtor's prison if we're working in a limited liability company. So there is a deal with society in our very existence as limited liabilities companies. And if society wants to move the goalposts on that deal because the world is changing, it has every right to do it and demand of corporations that it delivers against it, 
corporation's side of that deal. So, yes, absolutely. Charles, it's very unfair, but you have 90 seconds. <laughs> okay. So very quickly, so Nicholas Beale's point, frame of mind, yes, frame of mind is very important. Having a virtuous frame of mind doesn't excuse you from doing fair process and trying to achieve a fair outcome. I mean, all three are important, but I think the frame of mind is absolutely fundamental because it shapes the way in which you think about what you're trying to achieve. And if business, if you think of business as a series of relationships, and if you start with a mindset and the frame of mind that I want to try and be fair to people, and I certainly want to try and avoid unfairness, if that's my frame of mind, I shouldn't use that to... Um, subvert a process, but it should ideally help guide towards achieving it. The B2B point, I think, I mean, we're working with a number of B2B businesses, and I've been quite struck, actually, by the number of people within those contexts who are really keen on this kind of idea, and I don't think it needs to come from outside. My sense is that there are an awful lot of people working in businesses of all shapes and sizes who really want to do this kind of thing, and who, and who have agency, and who see that businesses can rediscover this sense of being human systems. And we don't need to actually put pressure on them from the outside. Some is needed, but there's an awful lot going on within organisations of people who really want to leave for something different. And finally, fairness, if you want to link it to other things, yes. But the problem with that, though, is that the word fairness can be used as just an emotional thing to attach to anything we like. And equally, the word it's unfair is often just an emotional reaction <coughs> to stuff we don't like. So I think that's the problem with the word fairness, which is what we've tried to do in this paper, is to say, can we find a serviceable way in which we can use the word fair so it actually helps advance the conversation rather than just gets in the way. And I do think the notion of fairness and wanting to be treated fairly, going back to the rights point, but also wanting to work for a fairer world and for business to see itself that that's part of its mission. Mark Carney very kindly gave a, a statement last year about Blueprint's work and he linked what we're, the, the principles that James talked about to creating a fairer society. He said businesses that run in this way should contribute to resetting the social contract, which is needed, as Justin said as well. So I, th I do think that owning properly an agenda around acting fairly is a really important part of what businesses should do in the next decade. Thank you, Charles. So thanks to the generous support of our partners at, Blue, uh, partners at Blueprint, we can continue the discussion over drinks downstairs in the Benjamin Franklin room. Um, <coughs> we'll be keeping this conversation going online uh, with the research projects here at the RSA on tech and society and good work, inclusive growth, and also also Blueprint's work, so do sign up to our website newsletters to be updated of our latest uh, project news. I'll give you one little positive thing to think about as you go downstairs, which is that one of the recommendations in my report to the government, which was launched in this room by Theresa May uh, 18 months ago, was to reduce from 10% to 2% the number of people in a company, workers in a company, who have to request it in order to have representation and rights to information and consultation. So that's gone from quite a high bar to a very low bar. And that might be a step forward towards a more democratic, a more industrial democracy in our firms. And I think that's one of the important ways to address power, to make sure that workers have representation and in rights to information and consultation. Hopefully that will pass through the House uh, tomorrow. So that will be a positive step. So please join me in thanking our terrific speakers, Charles, Honora, Justin and Jane.